Welcome to a thought-provoking episode of Municipal Affairs. Today, we have a special focus on the dedicated men and women who play a crucial role in ensuring the safety and well-being of our communities within Alberta. Joining us are two distinguished guests who represent the Alberta Association of Community Peace Officers. The AACPO serves as the collective voice of over 600 community peace officers spread across more than 125 municipalities in Alberta. These officers, known as CPOs, hold a unique position within our communities. Employed by authorized employers under the Alberta Peace Officers Act, they are entrusted with the enforcement of a wide array of federal, provincial, and municipal statutes, all aiming at maintaining peace, safety, and order within our municipalities. But it doesn't stop there for the CPOs. These remarkable individuals go beyond their official duties, many of them actively volunteering their time, their expertise in various community initiatives, from mentoring programs like Big Brothers Big Sisters to drug awareness programs like DARE, from search and rescue operations to coaching local sports teams, and even supporting events like the Special Olympics. These community peace officers embody the spirit of community involvement and service, contributing significantly to the well-rounded development of the areas that they serve. Now, one crucial aspect to highlight is that while these officers are typically employed by the municipal governments in Alberta, their appointment as peace officers falls under the jurisdiction of the Alberta Public Safety and Emergency Services Ministry. Community peace officers are often the first responders on the scene of motor vehicle collisions and other emergency situations within our municipalities. They work tirelessly alongside our police, fire, our EMS crews, providing the invaluable support to ensuring the safety of all of our communities. Now today, we have the privilege to gain deeper insights into the world of community peace officers. Our guests today are Sergeant Terry Miller, President of the Association of Community Peace Officers, and Sergeant Mark Sproul, Vice President of the Association of Community Peace Officers. Together, they both bring their wealth of knowledge and expertise to help us better understand the vital role these officers play in making Alberta's community safe, vibrant, and resilient. So with that, this is Municipal Affairs. Um, sergeants, I want to thank you both uh, so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. It's always great to sit down with people who are on the front lines of making our municipalities better and our communities stronger. I want to start with the uh, uh, opening question, and this goes to both of you. Uh, can you just give me a brief overview of how you have both gotten to the position to where you are today? A little bit of a CV resume, if you would, uh, talking about how you become the community peace officers in the counties and the president and vice president of the Alberta Association of Community Peace Officers. Sergeant Miller, do you want to take that one first? Sure. Um, I started uh, my law enforcement career probably in the early 80s when I worked with the, with the RCMP as an auxiliary officer in a number of uh, municipalities. Um, found a love for the municipal side of law enforcement and had the opportunity to uh, become a peace officer, or at that time, a special constable in the town of Sundry, where I worked for five years. And then I moved uh, to the town of Olds and was uh, asked to come to Clearwater County approximately 23 years ago. Um, a regret, none at all. Uh, love, the, uh, love the career path that I've chosen to be able to work with the communities. Um, I've been with um, Clearwater, like I said, for 23 years. I've been in numerous roles within the Alberta Association of Community Peace Officers um, since that time and have worked my way up to the current position of president of the association that I've been in that role for approximately eight years, I believe. Um, and the love for um, the peace officer program just uh, was one of the things that drove me to the position that I'm currently in and uh, wanting to make the program uh, more robust and better, safer program for the new officers that are coming into that role. Thank you so much, Sergeant. Sergeant Sproul, what about yourself? How did you get to become the vice president of the association? <laughs> 
Well, absolutely. Uh, well, my uh, law enforcement uh, career uh, began uh, by by attending uh, Lethbridge College uh, at the time and going through a criminal justice program uh, back in the early 2000s. After graduating out of that, I uh, started with the uh, province of Alberta uh, within their commercial vehicle enforcement branch, uh, now the uh, the sheriff's branch. So after spending uh, just over four, uh, four and a half years with them, I switched over to the uh, community policing uh, side of things and have been a community peace officer uh, since uh, 2009 now, uh, when I started with Lacombe County. And it's been a journey right along the way, uh, promoted to, uh, to sergeant in 2016, and in two, uh, 2018, uh, took on the uh, vice president role with the uh, AACPO there, the Alberta Association of Community Peace Officers. Within that time, I've also uh, acted as a uh, deputy director of emergency management. I sit on the uh, all hazards incident management team uh, for Central Alberta. And uh, I'm also a uh, search manager uh, with Search and Rescue. So quite often uh, you'll see uh, community peace officers get heavily uh, involved within the, uh, the communities in which they're serving. And you'll see a, a number that are even uh, volunteer firefighters and, uh, and work in various uh, community-based uh, positions there. Uh, within my uh, term as vice president for the association, uh, one of my driving uh, passions there is just echoing, I guess, uh, what Sergeant Miller had said there was just safety of the officers uh, that are out there working in our communities, wanting to make sure that they have the uh, the tools to effectively uh, conduct uh, their their jobs, keep uh, both themselves and their community safe uh, while they're out there serving. I want to ask the overarching question about the association. And for those who may not know, and I will be honest, I'm one of these people that came to municipal governance uh, up in Slave Lake, Alberta. Uh, I, I dealt with community peace officers up there. I worked hand in hand with them. Uh, I didn't know about this organization. So for the for my listeners and for the municipal leaders who are listening to this, because that's our traditional audience target, who is the Alberta Association of Community Peace Officers? Who wants to take that answer question? I guess I can, um, and Mark can sort of uh, supplement anything that I've missed. Um, the Alberta Association of Community Peace Officers was formed. Uh, it'll be our 35th anniversary in 2024. So we've been around for a long time. Um, our organization uh, works with the authorized employers of community peace officers to ensure that they're getting information and uh, um, the best practices for, for their peace officers in their community. We're kind of a voice to government, a link to government right now. Uh, if there's concerns that come out from municipalities, uh, they can request our assistance with regards to getting that information uh, gathered and then presented to the different levels of government. Um, we are a training entity as far as the peace officers themselves uh, are concerned. And so far as uh, we offer a lot of training sessions throughout the year, uh, especially at our spring conference, which is usually held in February, where we spend a week um, doing different levels of training with officers that come in from all over the province. Currently, our membership is uh, approximately 130 authorized employers with just over 1,200 officers being employed as community peace officers within our organization. So I'm not sure, Mark, if there's anything else you want to add to that. Yeah, certainly, uh, Terry, uh, our association, we've had a very long-standing history uh, within Alberta, uh, as you mentioned there, coming up on 35 years. Uh, we found it critical to our uh, success as an association, really engaging in, in partnership with our key stakeholders, uh, that being Alberta Justice and Solicitor General, Public Safety Emergency Services, and groups like the Rural Muni Municipalities of Alberta and uh, Alberta Municipalities Association. It's through these partnerships that we've really seen leaps and bounds. And, uh, and by working together in these collaborative approaches, we've actually uh, seen some really cool projects uh, come together uh, for the benefit of uh, the communities in which uh, our officers are working in and, uh, and really for their safety as well. 
Um, I, I guess I should have asked this before we started, but do you mind if I call you Terry and Mark? Uh, do you prefer that or do you prefer the title sergeant? So I just want to make sure I'm doing this correctly here. Terry works for me. <laughs> And Mark is just fine. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Mark, I want to follow up on something you just said there. You work with different levels of uh, government organizations. Now, community peace officers in the province are uh, sort of regulated by the provincial government, but you are dealing with municipal issues and municipal regulations as well. Does that is that a challenge for community peace officers when you're dealing with two levels of government and you're trying to ensure that uh, what the province is doing, what the municipality are doing are cohesive and going out and making sure that the community is safe at the end of the day? Well, absolutely. And uh, so one of the, uh, the things that you'll find with community peace officers, they not only have to be experts in regards to that provincial legislation, which their uh, their appointments are come from underneath the Alberta Peace Officer Act, but they also have to be familiar with all the municipal types of legislation as well. And uh, and and sometimes uh, it's uh, it's finding that uh, that balance and navigating through those uh, complexities. And and sometimes when you're in a municipality, the the differences between the bylaws and those provincial uh, rules and regulations. Um, sometimes there's some contradictions, and so knowing where to appropriately uh, act and and enter into investigations and where your authority comes from on each investigation. Uh, a lot of community peace officers in the province are also appointed under the municipal uh, municipal government and act as bylaw enforcement officers, and so that's a separate uh, appointment altogether. And so. Uh, bridging the the authorities that you have underneath the peace officer act as a peace officer and also relating that to a bylaw enforcement officer under that uh, separate legislation is there confusion around what the role of a community peace officer is because you talk about sheriffs you talk about bylaw officers and then you talk about community peace officers what is the biggest misconception of what a community peace officer does. Uh, Terry, do you want to take this one? Because I feel like as president, you've been there for some time. You've seen the role of community peace officer change. And I can imagine that there is a misperception from the general public even about what the role of a community peace officer is and does. Yeah, absolutely. You're you're 100% correct there. Um, sometimes we get mistaken as uh, police officers. We get people calling us with regards to things that are outside of our authority to deal with. Other times we get uh, dealt with at the lower level, like we're not educated. Um, possibly, uh, you know, they, they don't take our authority seriously. They don't, um, people are just confused. So most people, when they deal with us on the roadside, uh, don't have a clue that we're not um, police officers. They they have the perception, the red and blue lights, the traffic enforcement. They just deal with us like we're RCMP. And then there's others that uh, know our roles and responsibilities that um, sometimes um, the respect just isn't there for us. So it's it's kind of a mixed a mixed um, gamut of things that go on within our our roles. I want to I want to talk about the perception and sort of the uh, the understanding. I can imagine that drastically changed during COVID nineteen because community peace officers were on the front lines of uh, dealing with some of the enforcement around bylaws around uh, gatherings, and there's probably a perception that they people just don't trust you anymore because you're coming to spoil all their fun. Did you see a big change around perception and a sort of what people looked for in their community peace officers during the COVID-19 pandemic? And even is it still around today? Mark? Yeah, absolutely. The uh, Through the pandemic, certainly uh, our community peace officers were on the front lines. They, uh, they were enforcing uh, various aspects of the uh, Public Health Act with the health orders that came out. Uh, and in addition to a number of bylaws that were passed by municipalities. So one of the things that, uh, you know, those few years were very challenging for everybody and, and law enforcement in particular. Uh, one of the things that gave us such a, a huge success in the areas that, uh, that I've, I've worked in is going into that uh, with the relationship with the community. We had a relationship going into it. 
Uh, and it was that relationship that brought us through. There was difficult times on both sides for everybody. And, uh, and you know, for a lot of areas, I think their, uh, their officers, because of those relationships, they were able to navigate through some of those complexities. Um, within Lacombe County, uh, one of ours was the, uh, the Whistle Stop Cafe. I mean, I think a, a lot of people have heard uh, about um, some of the things that went on out there. And, and I just, uh, you know, it, it was relationships uh, that brought us through it all the way. Uh, there were some tough, uh, tough days. Um, but I feel that today uh, we still have a, a very good relationship with our community, despite having to get involved with uh, some of those enforcement actions along the way. And, uh, and so that, that definitely takes a toll. I know in Ottawa there, uh, they still have officers that are off from, from some of the stuff. And, and certainly here in Alberta, uh, a lot of our community peace officers as well are, are still navigating through um, some of the, uh, I don't want to call them traumas, but I just, it was a very difficult time. And there's still some, uh, some things that a lot of men and women are, are working through uh, in regards to that time. Barry, did you want to add anything about the perception around uh, what community peace officers are going through after the pandemic and even during the pandemic? Because uh, Mark talks about the relationship that community peace officers need with their communities. But so it, there was sometimes when you saw via social media that relationships were not non-existent because people just didn't trust you and didn't want to even deal with peace officers or police officers. So for you during that COVID-19 pandemic, and I know this is just a short period of time that we're going to be talking about, and then we're going to move on to some of the bigger issues, but did you see a relationship sort of deteriorate and try to build that back after the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, no, I have to agree with Mark. I think the relationships that we made within the communities, um, definitely helped us from our enforcement side. Uh, our unit that I work with currently um, does a lot of traffic and infrastructure protection. So there was a lot of um, a lot of relationship building when it came to the traffic side of it, uh, because the majority of the traffic work was being done by the community peace officers within their communities. Um, so I have to agree with Mark. I think that there's uh, some some things that we have to work through afterwards, but from a community perspective, I think we've gained a lot of respect from our communities that we work in with regards to how we dealt with um, the pandemic and dealing with the health issues and et cetera. You, you talk about relationships and building those relationships. In the opening introduction, Mark talked about how peace officers are not just peace officers, community peace officers, they're volunteer firefighters. They're big brothers and big sisters. They're working in nonprofit groups, working as volunteers in the community. How important is it for community peace officers to sort of enter into the community and not just be peace officers, but be part of the community as well, particularly in this day where trust and uh, sort of uh, belief in what the uh, officers are doing is so fragile. Anyone wants to take that, go for it. <laughs> I'll let Mark that one. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first off, I'll just start with uh, without the support of the uh, the community, it makes it very challenging for any law enforcement organization to have a positive impact and be able to police effectively within their community. Um, you know, there were a lot of challenges over uh, through the pandemic there, uh, but coming out, uh, I mean, Alberta strong. I mean, our our officers throughout the province they uh, they pulled through. Uh, and you know what, it's, we've had a lot of support uh, from our, not only our community, uh, but associations like Valor House, Legacy Place, um, the, uh, the Before Operational Stress uh, Training Program. Uh, there's a lot of resiliency programs and organizations out there. And, and when we get together throughout the year with our, uh, with our members and their officers, we really push that it's important to take care of yourself mentally and physically and uh, and have those tools in the toolbox so that when we go through those tough times uh, because it happens uh, that you you have a reserve in the tank and uh, you know that's taking the time with friends and family 
It's taking the time to, you know, invest in yourself uh, through uh, different training programs to ensure that uh, that you have the capacity and, and mental stamina uh, to pull you through. Does the association have any tools or uh, helpful uh, resources that community peace officers can access if they do feel sort of run down or if they're uh, feeling a little bit uh, overwhelmed by the experience? Because I can imagine the day-to-day operations of a peace officer, community peace officer, you see some different things. I know you work hand-in-hand with EMS, with uh, the RCMP, with municipal uh, police officer, uh, forces. Do Does the association have resources that helps their community peace officers deal with the day-to-day things that they see? Terry? Mark did mention um, Valor House and a few other agencies that we actually have access to for our officers. In um, in the spring during our conference, uh, we definitely spend a lot of time bringing people in, resources in to, uh, to identify, you know, the, the services that are out in the community to help the officers sort of cope and deal with um, their day-to-day lives and the effects that their positions in the community have on them. Uh, so, Critical incident stress management teams are also available. A lot of um, municipal agencies have their own um, uh, mental health workers within those municipalities. So we encourage a lot of our officers to take advantage of all of the different programs that are out there. Uh, The before operational stress one was uh, the BOSS program. We were definitely working with them and continue to work with them. It's uh, online sort of resource that we utilize for our officers and give them access to to that program and it's been very very helpful in dealing with some of the stresses and uh, incidents that have occurred within our communities safety seems to be a top priority for your organization and for both of you um now both of the safety and for the peace officers i should clarify is a big priority for uh, the association um how can municipal organizations, cities, towns, villages, summer villages, uh, and community members, and I say community members, people who actually live in the community, ensure that community peace officers are safe on the job and they are doing their job because they're there to keep their community safe? So I, I want to start with Terry on this one, and then we'll jump to Mark, because I think this is an important uh, area that we need to talk on because we are seeing the rise of a lot of uh, crimes right now. And the one thing I want people to be is safe and you guys are on the front line. So how can municipalities and residents keep you safe? I think it's really important for any municipality that employs community peace officers to continually be aware of the trends that are in their community Um, to review the roles and responsibilities of their peace officers within their communities and also do a risk hazard assessment for based on the roles and responsibilities that they have. Um, We are, as an association, currently uh, doing a review through a a consultant uh, to make sure that the risk assessments for all peace officers in the province are being looked at from a global environment, and then uh, hopefully getting some mitigation um, out of that, out of that consultant to assist and help those municipalities understand some of the risks that their peace officers um, face on a day-to-day basis. Um, Very important for every municipality, and sometimes it's difficult for those smaller municipalities to understand it, but it's very important if they employ those community peace officers that they understand that there are definite risks that may be different than other employees within the community, um, within their municipality, that they have to address. And uh, sometimes it's hard to address some of the, the items that could cause problems like the crime rates, the weapons that we're seeing, um, you know, the um, misuse of the drugs in the community. Those are all things that community peace officers deal with. And if the municipalities want to ensure the safety of their officers, they'll make sure and review, conduct that hazard assessment on an annual basis and mitigate or try to mitigate or request somebody to mitigate 
um, those risks so their officers can stay safe. Mark, do municipalities play a role in ensuring the safety of their community peace officers by not just ensuring that they look at what the community peace officer is doing, but give them the right tools? Because I think that's the big thing that we want to make sure that I get away here is uh, you, you can make sure they're safe if community peace officers don't have the right tools to go out and deal with some of these calls that Terry was just talking about, then there's no point of sending them because they're not going to be safe in the situation where it could potentially turn dangerous. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, municipalities have a uh, responsibility under the Occupational Health and Safety Code to do those assessments, as, as Terry had mentioned. Uh, one of the things that is very unique to the Peace Officer Program is we have uh, two classes of peace officers underneath that legislation. We have Alberta peace officers, so your provincial sheriffs, and you've got your community peace officers. And uh, the only difference when it comes to those two groups, uh, for the most part, is the employer. Uh, at this time, the, the Provincial Peace Officer Act, through legislation, actually re restricts uh, the tools that are available to community peace officers. Um, but in turn uh, permits uh, a much wider range of tools uh, to those Alberta peace officers uh, based solely on um, them being the employer. So certainly there's, you know, Terry had mentioned that we, uh, we're going through a bit of a, a review right now in the pro province. Uh, we're looking at a, a greater scope of uh, job duties, functions, uh, because every community peace officer that you see in Alberta is not uh, not the same and they don't carry out the same duties and functions and so because of that uh, we're trying to uh, to take that global uh, snapshot and, and look at the functions that our peace officers or community peace officers are doing do they have the tools that they need are there barriers in legislation and uh, and our our employers appropriately applying those hazard and risk assessments to ensure their uh, employees are safe out there now, we we talk about the uh, different areas and the different uh, parts of this province, and they're all facing their own unique challenges. Now, you both represent two communities that are considered more rural communities. Now, I want to talk about the rural aspect of community peace officers, because um, as you know, as you probably have driven every single road in your community, communities in rural areas are large, they're vast. And that means response times can potentially be impacted on getting to an accident, getting to a call, following up on a bylaw concern. How, how has the large, vast areas of rural counties changed the way that community peace officers deal with responding to calls and dealing with responding to uh, possible infractions from residents? Mark? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so in Lacombe County, uh, where I'm stationed, uh, we, uh, we cover a fairly large area. And, uh, and so if a call comes in uh, on the other end of the county and you happen to be, you know, it can be an upwards drive of 35, 45 minutes at times. And uh, I know for other employers and, and the agencies in the province like Terry, um, it can be a couple hours, uh, three, uh, three hours or more. And so the, the areas that our community peace officers are, uh, are covering are quite large. And, uh, and quite often within those areas, we're dealing with uh, five uh, or more policing uh, detachments within that area. So it's uh, trying to keep continuity, uh, trying to bridge that communication between uh, us and, and other law enforcement agencies. But also uh, bringing it back to safety as well. You know, when our officers are out there and they run into a situation and, uh, and that, that situation, all the situations that our officers deal with are dynamic. They're, they're changing all the time. And, and in some cases, the safety of those officers is affected. We're always thinking about where's the backup coming from? Where is our support coming from? If, if we run into an issue out here, who's going to come help us? And, and in some cases, that help can be that same amount of distance away of a couple of hours. And so it's, uh, it really, you know, and it brings us back to that relationship and having that relationship within the communities so that we can enter into some of those tough, uh, 
uh, complex investigations with a relationship in place, which ultimately helps with the officer safety at the end of the day. Carrie, for yourself, Clearwater County is a massive, and I say massive in the probably the the biggest way that I can, uh, area that the community peace officers have to cover. Has the role of the community peace officer changed in Clearwater County to address more rural areas? Because you talk about the relationships and the communications between other levels of uh, police enforcement, whether it be police or even sheriffs. Do you have to look at each call when it comes in and say, okay, maybe I can't get to this one, even though I've been called out because there's a sheriff closer and they'll be able to help out in that area compared to me driving three hours to get out to there? Absolutely. We definitely have to prioritize um, the different events that we attend. Um, as you indicated, it is a large, uh, a large municipality and Mark did uh, evade to the length of time that it takes sometimes for us to get to where we have to go. So we do prioritize. Um, we try to assess each call and make sure that there's somebody in the area that maybe can deal with it uh, in a more timely manner than we would be able to. Again, back to the safety, the safety of our officers is imperative and, and super important for us. We don't want our officers to you know, end up in a motor vehicle collision, trying to get to some event um, when there was somebody closer. So the lines of communication that we have between the different agencies has to be very clear and open and everybody has to be on the same page. As far as, you know, if we don't attend, it's not because we don't want to, it's because there was maybe somebody closer and it was safer for them to attend than it was for us. Now, I've had the pleasure to drive through both Clearwater County and Lacombe County over the last month. And I and I, I ask this question all in all seriousness. Um, my self reception in those communities is not the best in some areas. Does that concern you? Because uh, as I can imagine you you have a radio on yourself there, Terry, and I, I, I'm assuming you will have a radio with yourself when you're out, Mark. But sometimes reception is not the best in some communities. Uh, how do how do peace officers deal with a no cell area? Because I can imagine you can't just leave a scene of a crime and then come back. And I'm not trying to ask this like as a stupid person. <laughs> I just want to know how do peace officers deal with the lack of cell reception in areas where you may be dealing with some pretty tough issues? Well, I know in our municipality, and I'm I'm sure it might be the same in other municipalities that are on the Eastern slopes where we have the challenges of communication with the mountains, et cetera. Um, we have the AFRAX radio, we have the fire radio, we have a satellite phone. We're looking at other, um, other options for us as far as um, cellular. So there's like, we look like porcupines driving down the road with so many antennas on. Um, but there are occasions where we have like no service at all um doesn't matter what we do as far as a municipality to ensure or to try and ensure communication there are areas within our municipality that we have nothing and um we spend a lot of time training our officers um to be aware of their surroundings to be aware of um, the situations they're going into you know communication with other officers communication with other agencies if they know they're going into certain areas um, that's about that's about all we can do. I don't think it's going to change in the mountainous areas as far as cellular. But... For yourself, Mark, does uh, do it? I I I, I want to ask this question yet again. I, I'm asking the stupid questions, but I feel like everyone tells me there's no such thing as stupid questions. Ha! I, I will prove you wrong one day, <laughs> listeners. Um, does does the rise of social media change the way that community peace officers have to respond to things? Wow. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. Uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it's amazing how social media has turned into a reporting platform uh, to, uh, to report crimes uh, or different uh, events that are happening within a community. A lot of times uh, our social media coordinators at our, uh, at our offices here, they'll come along a, uh, a post of an event occurring within uh, our municipality and uh, it hasn't been called in. Nobody's called 911. They haven't called it into our municipal office. Uh, it's just reported online. 
And so you're trying to navigate uh, some of those things as well as trying to provide some education as into how to properly uh, report uh, when an incident is occurring within the community. So how should people report incidents? Because we, we talk about how uh, I've dealt with staff sergeants at the RCMP detachments on a regular basis as a former communications person for a town. And they say, if you don't report it, we can't respond to it, but we also can't get more resources available to help more uh, incidents like this. So for community peace officers, is it the same line? Do people need to report things that are going on and not just assume that they're going to get reported? And even if it is just a broken broken in a car or uh, a bylaw infraction, they need to report this. So that way you can go back to your municipalities and say, look, this is what we're dealing with. We either need to get more people or change our way that we're uh, servicing our community as community peace officers. I think um, people definitely need to report. And I know there's been a trend lately that, you know, they don't feel like there's a need to report because nobody attends or we're not getting the service or whatever it is, whatever the reason is. It's very important for them to report it statistically for us. It gives us information of trends happening within our community. It gives us the ability to uh, you know, do more patrols to areas that are having bigger problems than other areas. And you know, same old saying, if we don't know about it, we can't help you fix it. Um, doesn't necessarily mean we're going to fix it, but we, if we don't know about it, we can't do anything to mitigate the problems that you're having. And from an RCMP perspective, I know that their crime stats um, it's very important for them to know as well where the hot spot areas are and then to relay them to us as well. How important is it for not only the community peace officers to have a good relationship with other or levels of organizations, but the municipalities to have uh, relationships with the le other levels of or uh, uh, organizations as well, because you're dealing with them, but if, the municipalities aren't talking to the EMS, aren't talking to the P uh, RCMP, the municipal police force. Things are just going to look like you're only talking to them and no one else is. So for you, and I know I'm asking a peace officer to talk about what a mayor and council should do, but I should ask, do you think that the municipalities have a bigger role in playing in fostering that relationship between different levels of organizations as well? Absolutely. The, uh, the municipality plays a big role. And uh, I can speak from uh, from what our council does at Lacombe County is they'll bring in all of our detachment commanders actually uh, from throughout Lacombe County. Uh, they'll bring in various levels of government. Uh, they've brought in uh, fish and wildlife in the past. Uh, they've uh, they've had we work with the SPCA, and uh, so there's a number of different levels of government and organizations. And and when it comes down to you mentioned earlier. Uh, first on scene to a uh, to a collision, for an example, uh, it might be a community peace officer officer that shows up uh, first on scene be just because of the nature of the uh, the circumstances. And pretty soon you've got not you've got a community peace officer, you've got the paramedic showing up, you've got the fire department. Uh, you know, maybe there's animals involved, so now you've got the SPCA in there as well. And everybody's got a component in a, in a job related function that they need to be there for and, and establishing that command and control uh, to be able to effectively manage that situation. Uh, and some of those situations get grow to be quite complex and, uh, and it's about establishing and having those relationships before you're meeting in the ditch on that day of the event. And, uh, and so we work collaboratively with our enforcement partners and it certainly makes, uh, when we do meet in the ditch, uh, that relationship is there. So we already know which part each agency is gonna take and what they're responsible for. And, uh, and it makes it a lot easier for us. I want to turn to my last subject, and it's about the future, the future of community peace officers in general here, because I am cautious of time, and I know you're both busy people. Uh, I, I, want to, I want to start with the big question, the challenges. 
what what do you both see as the biggest challenges facing community peace officers heading into the next five years, 10 years? And I'm not trying to be that because I'm going to ask the flip side question in about two seconds after you're done answering. And what are the opportunities for peace officers? So in your opinion, right now, right here, what do you see as the biggest challenges and how can we start to address them today? One of the challenges that we're always going to face is that we have several different employers. Um, I think what needs to happen is there needs to be more top level, um, top level down sort of um, regulatory dictation with regards to the roles and responsibilities these officers have in the community to make it more, um, what's the word I'm looking for, to make it more sort of conducive to that, to the whole program and not just to that community. I know that community-based programs are important, but I think that uh, there's lots of areas that community peace officers can move into um, to help make the communities safer, that they're not being given the ability to do um, because of limitations from different levels of government. Mark, what about yourself? What do you see as the challenges that face community peace officers today? Or are you just gonna echo what uh, Terry just said? I certainly echo uh, what Terry said, but one of the one of the biggest challenges uh, that we find is so our employers are are the municipality, and so you've got municipal um, managers, directors, uh, councils that are not law enforcement that are responsible for uh, directing OHS um, hazard risk assessments. So when you're not in law enforcement. And you don't have the uh, the background, the uh, the use of force training. Uh, how it makes it very challenging uh, to be able to apply the um, risk mitigation. Uh, I'll, I'll say uh, when it comes to you know which tools are necessary to do the job, and and uh, how do you mitigate risk uh, when it comes to law enforcement? And so because we have so many employers throughout the province. Uh, you've got, uh, you know, Terry had mentioned 130 employers as part of our organization. 130 employers are going to apply that risk matrix all a little bit differently. And what might uh, be identified as risk for one won't uh, be identified as a risk for others. And so, you know, going to uh, what Terry had mentioned about the province does need to, I believe, take a more active role. In, in helping frame uh, what risks are associated with the tasks that our, our officers are conducting out there and, and hold a little bit more of the uh, responsibility when it comes to uh, the tools uh, that are available to our uh, community peace officers and, uh, and their role in keeping them safe. I, I never end on a negative question, so I'm going to ask about the opportunities that the community peace officers face in the coming years. So uh, I'm going to start with Mark, and then we'll end with Terry on this one. But what opportunities does the community peace officer program, these uh, people that you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, have coming towards it for the next five years? Wow. Um, <laughs> you know what, with the community peace officer program, our officers are just so engaged in the uh, the communities. Uh, I just want to share a little bit of some of the work uh, that they're doing. Uh, this last, uh, this over the last two weeks with back to school, we've had uh, officers uh, engaged uh, attending breakfast with students, flipping pancakes, uh, wel welcoming the, uh, the kids back into the classroom. Um, and there's been just such a number of wide, uh, there's been a wide number of uh, public events that uh, our officers are able to engage in to positively impact their municipalities. And, uh, and you know what, I don't see that component changing over the next five years. I see, if anything, I see them getting more involved in the community, uh, coaching their, their local sports teams, uh, participating uh, in, uh, in their, their local uh local uh, schools to uh, to help out with students groups the big brothers the big sisters the, the dance classes the ballet the the girl guides uh, programs that are out there uh, there's so many officers that are out there engaging on that and and so that's that's a huge focal point for me uh, the thing though 
uh, the safety of those officers while they're out there, that's, that's a priority for me and it, and it will continue to be so, uh, Harry, what about yourself? What opportunities do you see coming down the pipeline for uh, community peace officers? And what opportunities do people have if they want to take out a career in being a community peace officer? Um, you know, I that's a really, really good question to ask me. Um, a number of years ago, I had the opportunity to join a municipal police force and chose to become part of a community and become a peace officer and spent 25 years of my my life in this career and couldn't think of a better career to be in. I think we're shortchanging the community peace officer side of law enforcement uh, when we go and present to school children or to universities about career paths. Um, to be part of a community is very, very fulfilling, life fulfilling, and I agree with what Mark said you become part of that community because you spend so much of your life in the community you're working in. Um, definitely, definitely um, look at it as part of your law enforcement career if that's the direction that you're going. Even if it's a, a stepping stone for another policing agency, um, become part of your community. As far as the um, the next five years for community peace officers, it's been a very exciting last five years. Um, we've seen a lot of change uh, from all levels of government. We've seen a lot of positive changes from policing agencies and uh, the provincial government. And our association is gonna continue, you know, moving forward to try and make those positive changes for the program. I think it's an integral part of the community that we live in and I think it's a very important part of the law enforcement continuum within this province and keeping people in our province safe. Well, I know I said that was going to be my last question, but I'm going to ask one more because it's my <laughs> show and I get to ask these questions. Where can people <laughs> learn more about your association? Where can people learn more about becoming a peace officer? What other resources do you want people to know about the Community Peace Officer Program, but also the Alberta Association of Community Peace Officers? Go ahead, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> well, certainly get it. online. Uh, you can visit our website at uh, www.aacpo.ca. Uh, or uh, next time you see a, a peace officer, hopefully not on the side of the road, but in a, uh, in a, uh, in a different encounter uh, that you just reach out and say, hey, you know, we're, how did you get into being a community peace officer and what can you tell me about it? Uh, and uh, we've got a number of really great uh, educational institutions here in the province that have great justice studies programs. And, uh, and I know for us at Lacombe County, we partner with Red Deer College. Uh, they're our neighbor here right to the south. And we'll take out practicum students uh, so that they can get a feel for what it is to be a community peace officer. And so just training up and bringing up that next level, uh, that next generation of law enforcement in the province. Sergeants, I want to thank you both from the bottom of my heart for taking time out of your busy schedule and sitting down and talking about the association of uh, so the Alberta Association of Community Peace Officers, but also the peace officers, community peace officers in our municipality. So thank you so much for doing this. And thank you so much for serving and protecting our communities. I don't think you guys get that thanks enough. And I'm going to start thanking you. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for inviting us. To our viewers and to our listeners, thank you so much for tuning in and for being part of this great conversation. Now, if you've enjoyed this episode, please hit that subscribe button so you can stay up to date on all of our latest content we have coming to you. From this show, Municipal Affairs, to the cross-border interviews, and even the political trenches, local government at work, we have you covered for all things municipally. Now, if you're able to, please consider backing the show to help us to continue to grow and produce more high quality content. Every little bit helps and we appreciate your support. A link to our support page on the Cross Border Interviews website is in the show notes. All the information and links provided in today's episode will also be linked in the show notes. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking. Thank you.